Welcome, I'm Bill Marshall. This is a talk about solar farms and why I favor their inclusion in the future of Maysville and Mason County. I hope that you will find this video informative. I start by believing that we all want a sustainable future for Mason County. If you differ with any of the information I present, I hope that you will tell me about alternate sources that will expand my understanding. If we can agree on the facts, then together we can make decisions that will move us to our goal. This video discusses the life cycles of a solar farm and what happens to the land when the solar farm reaches end of life. I've been researching solar farms for over two years and my research has led me to favor solar farms in Mason County. Let's start with some history on how electric reaches a consumer. Originally, a geographic area was typically served by a single power company. Through the 50s, the power was usually generated by a fossil fuel boiler driving a steam turbine. That company owned and managed the generation, transmission, and distribution of the electrical energy. This total integration model began to break down as some consumers found that their local power company charged more than those in other areas. Deregulation spread through industries like railroads, telephones, and airlines and into the electrical utility sector. Regulators divided the process of supplying power to consumers into thirds, generation, transmission, and distribution. Their goal was to introduce competition into our electric supply by developing wholesale electric markets. Today, some utilities still generate, transmit, and distribute the power that they sell to their customers. However, a good portion of electric sold to consumers is first purchased at wholesale from a third party. In some regions, wholesale purchases can be made through centralized wholesale electric markets, operated by regional transmission authorities and independent system operators, RTOs and ISOs respectively, but commonly referred to as RTOs. PJM is an RTO that coordinates wholesale electric movement in all or part of 13 states in the District of Columbia. Most of Ohio and some of Kentucky's power flows through PJM. RECC participates in PJM. LG and E and KU do not. New sources of electric have become available. Government subsidies allowed solar to reach economics of scale. As the current least cost alternative, Solar no longer needs government subsidies. Within a regional transmission organization's transmission footprint, wholesale purchases and sales may also be made through markets operated by that RTO. The regional transmission organizations also determine energy prices paid in these markets through an auction process. A new auction begins when the RTO solicits power by issuing a Request for Proposal, or RFP. The RFP will define the amount, when the power is to be delivered, and other appropriate specifics. Each potential producer offers to sell the quantity of power that they expect to have available at that future time. All offers received are ranked in ascending cost order. In that order, each offer's quantity is added until the total quantity of that and lower cost offers is equal to or greater than the RFP's quantity. The price of the offer that fulfilled the last portion solicited is called the market clearing price. All producers whose offers were at or below the market clearing price will also be paid the market clearing price. RFPs are awarded far enough in advance so that a, so new capacity can be built between the time the bid is accepted and the electricity is first due to be delivered. An accepted RFP can be used as collateral to borrow the money needed to develop a solar farm. Let's look at how a solar farm is cited, bids on the RFP or request for proposal, all the way through until the solar farm reaches its end of life. And maybe of even more interest to us, what happens to the solar farm 
when it does reach the end of its economic life. Nearly independent power grids provide the United States electric. Well before there is a request for a proposal, someone has to identify areas whose regional trading organizations are likely to issue requests for proposals. Based on that forecast, the life cycle of solar farm starts. This pre-planning phase, the concept, trying to figure out where the potential site should be to be able to bid on an RFP, a feasibility study of the site, negotiating an option for a long-term lease on this specific site, financing and payments needed, and permitting and licensing all happen in this pre-planning phase. The last step of this phase is to submit a bid for the request for proposal. The design and engineering phase starts when a bid on a request for proposal is awarded to the site. When the request for proposal bid is accepted, these things happen. Specifications are drawn up, outline and detailed design is completed, and energy estimates are made. The first three phases called the project segment and are complete when the solar farm construction is finished. The first and second phases typically span one or two years, depending on how long it takes to win a request for proposal bid. The start of phase three is when the option to lease the site is exercised and marks the start of the land coming out of its prior use. This construction phase may take up to another year and includes procurement, contracting logistics, site preparation, environmental mitigation, subsystem assembly, certification of the solar farm, and connection to the power grid. The operational maintenance phase is 30 years or more. The graphic is obviously not to scale. During the operational phase, the objective is to protect the investment by run and maintaining the solar farm to deliver the projected energy performance, all while staying in compliance with all the applicable rules and regulations. At the end of solar installation phase of life, the th objectives are to comply with the end-of-life regulations, to reuse the materials, and prepare the site for the next use. How have you solar farms end of life much like the end of life for an alfalfa field. Alfalfa is expensive to establish and a solar farm is expensive to establish. Alfalfa converts solar energy into a high value forage. With careful management an alfalfa stand can produce for five to eight years. With alfalfa you cannot follow alfalfa with alfalfa. After solar you can reestablish a solar farm. I expect that after disposing of all the solar collectors at end of life, the best use would is likely to install the then current solar technology. The site prep work and gathering infrastructure is already in place. I expect a lower initial investment on a reestablished solar farm than on a competing site that would need to be prepared from scratch. Allowing solar farms in Mason County does not constraint other land uses in the area. It does have benefits compared with alternative land uses though. What better way to measure a new enterprise than with the goals stated in the comprehensive plan for, of Maysville and Mason County. Solar farms can improve our quality of life because compared to current land use alternatives, solar reduces soil erosion. It reduces fertilizer leaching from crop fields into our environment. It reduces pollution from row crop herbicides. Solar provides a viable alternative and reduces the sod and grass being cut up by livestock on pastures in wet weather or from livestock in confinement generating point source pollution of odor and animal wastes. Solar farms will increase employment. Solar farms will need some labor for equipment maintenance and even more labor will be used for mowing. Solar will require more labor than either cash grain or cow-calf operations on the same acreage. Our area used to sell tobacco, milk, and textile products to the world. We've lost those markets. Solar farms can replace those lost cash flows into our community. 
Solar farms can provide a strong revenue stream to support land ownership, and solar farms can also help support our community services. It's fairly normal for a 100-acre parcel to contribute $24,000 yearly to local community taxing authorities. Remember, a producing solar farm needs few community services. A solar farm does not need natural gas, city water, sewer or landfill capacity, it doesn't need rail, it doesn't need river, or large capacity road systems. Solar farms help reach each economic development goal the comprehensive plan lays out, while also supporting land ownership. This graph demonstrates that solar is, even without tax subsidies, now the least cost source of wholesale electric. Think about the amount of money that 59% of the U.S. total electric bill represents. Solar is the least cost source. We need to replace the revenue lost with the decline of dairy and tobacco. That makes it critical that our land use regulations allow solar to contribute to our community. In addition, making solar conditional use in A-1 zones and prohibiting them in industrial zones will help us gain maximum benefit for our community infrastructure investments. In addition to this video, Phases of Solar Farm Enterprise, please check out cwmclass.com slash solar dash farm dash in. I hope you will look at the other of my videos that may interest you. They are an introduction video, one on will status quo agriculture serve our next generation, solar farm zoning regulations in Maysville and Mason County, one on why solar farms should be in land use zone 1A, one on appropriate setbacks for solar farms, and frequently asked questions about a solar farm, and then a summation video. My understanding of the facts led me to favor solar as a long-term way to support land ownership in our area and to generate revenue for the entire community. I look forward to your comments. That's my physical and email address. Uh, thank you.